Welcome to this uh, lecture series on pulse width modulation for power electronic converters. So, uh, this is actually you know for some of you who may know or might not know like uh, this is very close to a particular course uh, called uh, PWM converters and applications uh, which is taught here, here at the Indian Institute of Science uh, for the masters and uh, PhD students. So, the students who are specializing in power electronics you do this as an elective course. So, this uh, lecture series is uh, very closely related to this particular course. So, what we have is uh, you know you want to modulate power converters you should get a good feel for the power converters and therefore, as I uh, have done this many times. So, we do this kind of you know we there is a we first look at the basics of power converters that is there are power electronic converters are essentially only switches. So, we look at how switches are connected for let us say DC DC conversion and DC AC conversion. So, we looked at it in one of the modules before and these power converters what are the primary purposes you know sometimes you know there is DC available you want AC you know you have an induction mode drive it needs variable frequency variable uh, amplitude AC. So, you might that is one application of a voltage source inverter. Another application is you can use a voltage source converter for active rectification which is also another application that you can think of and you can sometimes use a voltage source converter to supply reactive power to the grid. So, that is uh, you know static uh, compensator and you can use these voltage source converters to pump power from renewable energy sources into the grid. Let us say you have some photovoltaic uh, cells and you can use a voltage source converter to power into that. So, they are useful in a variety of applications now. And what happens is in all these applications, so you know this voltage, the voltage source converter, it has three things like you know one is the DC voltage, other one is the modulation, and then the AC voltage. So these three are mutually related. So the modulation determines the efficiency, particularly you are worried about efficiency. So and the modulation also determines, let us say, things like waveform quality. When you do a DC AC conversion you are not producing sinusoid you are producing with lot of harmonics. So, we are trying to do this. So, this course on modulation what exactly it tries to do is it tries to give a background on generally on power electronic converters for DC AC uh, um, um, conversion and uh, various applications of these and tries to give certain fundamentals which will help you understand the PWM methods for motor drive applications and probably you know under do certain analysis on what you would want to do. For example, how much uh, harmonic distortion would be there or how much pulsating torque would be expected and such things like that. So, certain amount of analysis and also amount of efficiency. So, these are the various things that we have really been doing now. So, so to get some background on that we had a short module on pulse width modulation. So, where we looked at uh, Fourier series how do you control and you know how do you control the fundamental voltage and uh, you know how one can possibly try to reduce the harmonics and so on. So, we looked at certain things like that and we looked at things like selective harmonic elimination and optimal offline optimal PWM etcetera in this other module on low switching frequency methods. So, then we started looking at this PWM generation which is more commonly used like this triangle comparison based PWM and space vector based PWM where the switching frequencies are typically much higher than the modulation frequencies. Then we looked at the analysis of the waveform quality. So, particularly of line current ripple how much current can be expected and things like this now. So, and uh, we also did an analysis of the DC link current and then torque ripple and uh, up to this part we have ignored all the losses and all that though from the line current ripple you can get the additional copper loss that uh, uh, will be there in the series elements. And the from the DC link current it is possible for you to calculate the capacitor RMS current and using the capacitor RMS current and the ESR it is possible for you to calculate the capacitor loss. Now, here we are focuses on the switching losses and the conduction losses the losses in the power semiconductor device. So, these are the various things which we did till now there are certain other operational issues that is one is inverter dead time. So, though you know for largely we have assumed the inverter to be ideal. I mean the devices all to be ideal the devices are not exactly ideal you know many times you can ignore the non idealities, but sometimes you cannot ignore the non ideality. So, for example, the devices are switching in a complementary fashion there is a finite amount of time it takes to turn on turn off you can for many analysis you can say oh ok I am going to say that it is instantaneous turn on instantaneous turn off, but when you practically switch an inverter you cannot ignore that. So, one of the things that you really do is introduce the so called dead time which we just saw in the previous lecture. So, the dead time what do you do? 
you are introducing some intentional delay between the switching on of the complementary devices. The, you, you, there, there are complementary devices. One is turning off, other one is turning on. Do not do the two concurrently. First you turn off and then you turn on the incoming device. So, that is the idea and that is what is called as dead time. And now, we are the, what we have been trying to see in this module, the last lecture in this lecture is to understand the effect this inverter dead time will have on the uh, inverter output. We considered sine triangle PWM primarily in the last lecture or you know continuous PWM schemes in general and we tried to see how this little dead time, the short delay between the switching off of one device and switching on of the other device, how does it affect the inverter output voltage. So, that is that, that was our burden of argument. So, now we will look at it a little more. So, we will we will we'll take a recap of quick recap of certain things and we do some things in a little more detail and we would also try to see instead of continuous PWM methods, if you use discontinuous PWM methods or bus clamping PWM methods, how the same dead time will affect the inverter and we will also see how exactly you can actually compensate, we will get some idea on how compensation can really be done now, right. Then we will look at then the subsequent modules we will look at over modulation and we will look at uh, this thing. So, over modulation is a non-linear region of modulation. So, you have a DC bus voltage and uh, with modular sine triangle PWM you are able to produce some AC waveforms. So, if you talk in terms of the peak phase voltage, so sine triangle PWM can give you a peak phase fundamental voltage of VDC by 2 or 0.5 VDC. Then with all the common mode injection etcetera or space vector based PWM you are able to move this all the way up to let us say 0.577 VDC or VDC by root 3, 1 upon root 3 times VDC. Now, if you go to 6 step operation, you can go to 2 by pi times VDC, something like 0.64 VDC. But between 0.577 VDC and 0.64 VDC, you need to operate in a non-linear range. That is, the reference voltage and the actual fundamental voltage will not be linearly related. So, it has certain challenges. So, how do you do that, etc. would be the burden of our discussion, would be you know subject of our discussion uh, in the next uh, module. So, we will finally, be looking at some pulse width modulation for multi level inverter. One reason is multi level inverters are important, they have been around for 3 decades and but they have been there has been a lot of active research in the last uh, decade and so on, but more important than that is one reason. If we have understood the PWM for 2 in level inverters properly, which we have been discussing all these days and if we have understood a multi level inverter properly, which we discussed in the very first module then we should be able to do this PWM for multi level inverter. Rather doing this PWM for multi level inverter would be a test whether we have understood the previous issues clearly or not. So, all that we have been doing with two level inverters are actually extendable to multi level three level inverter. We just need to know how exactly to do that including today's discussion which is really a dead time. So, let us today once again come back and focus on the dead time effect for two level inverters. So, the various things that which we have been discussing in this module are what is inverter dead time, we have seen this. What is that? There are complementary devices, there are gating signals, the outgoing device is turned off first and the incoming device is turned on later, there is a small amount of time TD is introduced between the two and that is called the inverter dead time. And what happens because of the inverter dead time? The pole voltage transitions, the instance at which the pole voltage switches from high to low or low to high, some of them change. Interestingly, it is not all of them changing. So, certain things change and it changes in one direction. That is sometimes all the transitions from low to high transitions, they are change, they, there is a delay. That is if, if it has got to change now, ideally it changes uh, some TD later, there is a delay and, uh, but the high to low does not change. So, and this is seen to be related to the direction of current. So, we actually we, we saw in the previous lecture how exactly this pole voltage transitions are affected. It is delayed sometimes by this dead time TD and uh, we looked at what would be the kind of error voltage. We looked at the dependence of error voltage on the direction of current for positive current or what we call as positive current the error is negative and vice versa. And uh, we looked at many for, you know um, uh, continuous PWM or particular focus was on sinusoidal PWM methods and we did this now. Towards the end of the last lecture we quickly looked at what kind of low frequency harmonic distortion you will have and what kind of error it will have and phasor analysis and so on. So, we will do a recap on that and then we will see how exactly possibly you can compensate the effect of dead time 
and more importantly in this lecture we will look at the effect of dead time. We will analyze the effect of dead time for bus clamping PWM methods which would be the most important uh, uh, topic in this lecture which we have not covered before alright. So, here we are talking of effect of dead time on invert output voltage. The last lecture was primarily on continual PWM schemes which we will review now. Here it is on bus clamping PWM schemes remember bus clamping PWM is also called discontinuous PWM. So, what happens here one of the phases clamped to the positive bus or negative bus at any point and other two phases are switching. Therefore, it is called bus clamping since only two phases are switching in a given carrier cycle. So, which two may change it may be R and Y or it may be Y and B. So, only two phases are switching in a given carrier cycle sometimes it is also called two phase modulation but the most common name is discontinuous PWM because the modulating signals used for this are discontinuous functions of time. So, discontinuous bus clamping PWM is probably the most widely known name for these PWM schemes and bus clamping PWM is also used and uh, then okay, occasionally the name two phase modulation is also used for this. So, now it is we are talking of the dead time effect in a voltage source inverter. So, first quick look at the voltage source inverter three different legs single pole double throw switch. The switches are supposed to be switching in a complementary fashion and that is where we have a difficulty now. The gating signal for the top and the bottom cannot exactly be complementary. The rising edges of both of them have to be delayed. The outgoing device has to be switched off first and the incoming device has to be switched on next. This actually means the rising edges of the gating signals have all got to be delayed by time T d. This is where there is a uh, very significant difference between the previous modules and now. So, they are not exactly complementary the complementary switches their signals are not exactly complementary now ok, but it continues to conduct. So, there is some small difference you know you normally you will expect this you know there is a transition from this uh, transistor to this diode and back from here and etcetera. The instance at which you would expect this transition will now slightly change as we have seen in the previous uh, lecture. So, if the transition is from transistor to diode there is no delay the switching is as per schedule on time, but if the transition is from the diode to the transistor then there is a delay in the voltage level changing. So, we anyway we will look at it shortly for a while now. So, we are going to look at this is a voltage source inverter these are complementary devices, but their actual signals are not are not really complementary their rising edges are all delayed by dead time T d. After your PWM produces the signals for top and bottom devices there is a dead time circuit which introduces this delay. So, you have this fed here now. So, we what we are going to look at is the pole voltage that is R voltage at this midpoint R measured with respect to O. So, we have already seen that the differences you know there is the between the ideal VRO and the actual VRO when you are looking at uh, continuous PWM. So, we will take a quick look at that once again now. So, once again you know the practical switches there are problems because of you know forward drop conduction loss and you may have finite turn on and turn off transition. This finite turn on and turn off transition leads to switching amount to switching energy loss this was our uh, subject in the last module, but this module what we are doing is because there is finite amount of turn on and turn off transition we are introducing dead time. So, we are turning off the outgoing device first and then turning on the incoming device next and there is a this certain amount of time uh, introduced between the interval uh, I mean uh, time is uh, delay is introduced between the two and that is what you call as dead time and this dead time has got to be much longer than the worst case device transition time this is what we saw previously. So, once again looking at the best known example of uh, you know modulation methods like sine triangle PWM three phase sinusoidal signals which are representing in uh, I mean uh, which are uh, uh, which correspond to R phase Y phase and B phase compared against high frequency triangular carrier and you produce the PWM signals. So, the output of this gives the top device and the complementary of that would normally give the bottom device now there is a small difference after that there is introduction of dead time as we discussed before. So, normally what you do you do a comparison we are now looking at just one carrier cycle if this is your modulation signal for R phase you compare the output is here the inverted output of the complementary of that is here. So, this is fed to the top device this is fed to the bottom device uh, are supposed to be fed to the top device and supposed to be fed to the top uh, bottom device 
in the RFS like ideally, but the situation is not ideal because the devices are not ideal, the devices are practical. If it were an ideal device, you would have fed like this and your pole voltage would have been like this because the devices are not ideal, you need to do something that is introduce dead time. So, why what, what is the non ideality that is affecting us? The finiteness of the transition times, the transition times are not 0, they are significant. It takes significant amount of time for the device to turn on. So, you know you, your gating signal might have gone high somewhere here and after that the current starts rising and after that the voltage starts falling and the voltage eventually falls somewhere here. So, there is certain amount of time and you need to have a dead time duration much higher than this. So, or you know it is better to look at the turning off device because you want the device to be turned off first before the incoming device is turned on. So, what you would do is so you would you would have turned off somewhere here and the, the after certain TD off off time delay time you will see that the voltage is rising and after that you see that the current is falling maybe first initially falling sharply and then falling more gradually. So, it falls here So there is certain amount of time interval you need to wait that is after your gating signal has been turned low somewhere here it is here that the device fully turns off and uh, this time can vary with the voltage level or this current level or the ambient temperature or junction temperature and so on and so forth. It can vary because of certain parasitics in the circuit. So, you can take no chances you have to allow for some time which is much longer than this switching interval and it is only after that time you should turn on the next device. So, that that device would turn on as shown here. So, that is the idea of our dead time when you do the dead time what do you do you turn off. Now, in this case the bottom device is to be the outgoing device you turn it off first the incoming device is the top device you do not turn it on immediately you delay by certain amount of time what you call as dead time. Again if you look at this edge the top device is the, the outgoing device the bottom device is the incoming device you first switch off the outgoing device like this the incoming device do not switch on concurrently delayed by a small time short interval of time. So, this is what you are going to get. So, in effect what is what are you doing you are delaying the rising edges if you have S 1 and S 2 you are doing nothing to the falling edges, but you are you are delaying the rising edges. So, this rising edge is delayed by T d again this rising edge is delayed by T d this is your dead time ok. So, this is not so this S 1 d and S 2 d are not exactly complementary in this interval for example, they are complementary in this interval they are complementary, but you look at this interval and you look at this interval they are not complementary. What else are they they are equal equal to what both are equal to 0. So, here that will never happen if this is 0 if this is 0 this will be 1 this is 1 this will be 0 here after we have introduced delay time you have the situation where S 1 d is 1 S 2 d is 0 or S 1 d is 0 S 2 d is 1 you also have the situation S 1 d is 0 and S 2 d is 0, but you will never have the situation S 1 d and S 2 d are concurrently high. What does it mean because it means a dead shot of the DC bus. In fact, your main reason why you are introducing the delay time is this if you switch them concurrently the complementary devices it is possible that it might get shorted and that is the reason you are delaying now. So, you do not want to go anywhere close to that 1 1 where both is the top and the bottom could be high that is why there is now. So, because of this what has happened there is certain interval of time during which both the gating signals are low, but the load is an inductive load which is like a current source during the switching transition it will just continue to conduct it will just demand a path for the current to flow through. So, if both the transistors cannot conduct one of the diodes will have to conduct which diode will conduct it depends on the direction of current. So, depending on the direction of the current either the top diode or the bottom diode will conduct. So, in this interval one of the diodes will conduct and in this interval also the same diode will conduct assuming that the current direction is the same you know in both these things now all right. So, you go here. So, it depends on the current direction. So, where there is a change in the current direction the current direction is negative here it is positive remember we have ignored the harmonics here we have ignored the harmonics that is all right which is a reasonable assumption which we have done before we we did this when we uh, were calculating conduction loss when we were doing DC link current analysis when we do a switching loss all this high switching frequency in the cases we we have ignored the ripple there is nothing no nothing wrong in this now but 
you know this that will lead to one consequence what is that if you are considering the smooth sinusoidal current on the fundamental component alone the zero crossing is very crisp on the other hand there is ripple on top of it there is a ripple on around that what will happen is sometimes you will have multiple zero crossings. So, this could make some significant difference. So, we normally assume that as I just mentioned here in the sub cycle when you are going to assume when, when we did the discussions you know analysis in the last class and you know when we will be doing again today we have been assuming that the current direction is always positive or always negative it is never going through 0, but it could go through 0. Sometimes it can also go through multiple zeros. for example, if there is a ripple now let us say this is what this is one carrier cycle time. So, let us say one carrier cycle is uh, 200 microseconds or you know this is 5 kilohertz now you also have 10 kilohertz uh, harmonics you have you may also have a small amount of 15 kilohertz harmonics. So, if your fundamental current is going through 0 then it is the ripple current that matters it is possible that you may have a ripple current like this you get my point I am showing it a little exaggerated it is quite possible that you have this may be very small current maybe a few milliamperes, but you know 100 milliamperes, 200 milliamperes. this current may actually fall go down and may go high. So, all these possibilities exist we are ignoring all these possibilities, but that is fine. Okay. So, we are considering this to be a nice sinusoidal current we are ignoring the ripple component. So, you should bear in mind that sometimes when you are dealing with a situation when the ripple is high. So, some results of this analysis you must question and you must you know make appropriate modifications to that that is the reason I am giving you this warning because there is an inherent assumption at least note down the assumption. So, when you are doing an analysis we should at least know the validity of this analysis. So, this analysis is valid when we are considering the whenever the fundamental current is uh, you know predominant and the harmonic currents are negligible right when it is like this. So, now we can go by this fundamental current the fundamental current is roughly equal to the actual load current now. So, there is certain amount of error how much is that error a small quantity excuse me how much is that error this is a small amount of error is it positive when the current is positive that error is like this that error is like this and then when the current is negative that error changes sign it's like this it's like this here again the error changes sign so what is this error this is there is an error between the instantaneous actual pole voltage and the instantaneous ideal pole voltage so we have considered that error between the actual pole voltage ideal pole voltage after that we have averaged it over every carrier cycle. So, how much is that value will be equal to let us do this. So, the error voltage is V d c and that voltage is seen for a duration T d in every carrier cycle which is 2 upon this 2 times T s. So, that is this voltage level this is actually minus V d c T d upon 2 T s here you will have V d c times T d upon 2 T s. So, let us call this as V error the average error voltage that is the error voltage which has been averaged over every carrier cycle right. So, this is the kind of error voltage. So, what is going to happen you are not going to get a sinusoidal phase voltage like this the phase voltage is going to have certain DC component added to that. So, you know this just to go ahead with uh, why you know whether it is positive error or ne negative error we just saw that if this is the direction of current excuse me if this is the direction of current these two conduct for the other direction of current let me change the color now just a moment. right for this direction of current one of these two will conduct. So, which one will conduct whenever the top getting signal the current is in this direction and the top getting signal is high this will conduct 
whenever the current is in this direction and the top gating signal is low this will conduct. Again whenever you have current flowing in this direction and the bottom gating signal is high then this transistor will conduct. Again if the load current direction is like this and the bottom transistor is low signal is low the top diode will conduct. So, that is how the logic is ok we are active device they will not do this otherwise they cannot conduct now. So, if what is going to happen is the diodes conduct during the dead times. Now, in this direction of current it is this diode that will conduct during the dead time. So, during the dead time whether you like it or not the voltage pole voltage will be minus V D C by 2. So, ideally it may be plus V D C by 2, but you will have minus V D C by 2 hence the error. Again let us say this direction of current during the dead time who will conduct during the dead time this transistor is not gated high. So, he cannot conduct. So, it is this diode which will have to conduct. So, during the dead time for this direction of current R phase is connected to the positive 1 and therefore, your pole voltage V R O is equal to plus V D C by 2. So, during the dead time neither of the two transistors are gated high only the diode has to conduct which diode conducts depends on the direction of current and once you can say which diode conducts you can say what the pole voltage is. So, the, the pole voltage can be set just depending upon during the dead time instance can be set based on what is the direction of current here. So, now this is way you go with the, the taking a relook at the actual average pole voltage and the ideal average pole voltage now. So, like the diode conducts, so the diode is conducting here the diode continues to conduct during the dead time whereas, ideally it should have switched here. So, if there were no dead time between the top and bottom, so it switches here, so it is here now. Uh, again, but, but here what happens the incoming device is a diode. So, the moment this is turned off the diode comes in now. So, as I have mentioned before if the incoming device is a transistor there is a delay the transition is getting delayed in the pole voltage gets delayed. On the other hand if the incoming device is a diode it does not get delayed. So, this is something which is given for the other direction of current, but the philosophy is same that is you know during the dead time it is a diode that conducts the transition is delayed if the incoming device is transistor the transition is not delayed if the incoming device is a diode all right. So, because of these rules what happens whenever your positive current or the so called positive direction of load current the actual pole voltage and ideal pole voltage are like that and you get a negative voltage pulse there is an error voltage pulse which is a negative voltage pulse you get you get one such negative pulse in every carrier cycle and this is of magnitude minus V D C and this is for time duration T D. Similarly, if you look at the positive load currents then what you will get going to get your actual pole voltage is like this and the ideal pole voltage is like this the difference between this two will be V D C the difference between the two will be V D C. So, you will get a for the so called negative direction of load current your error voltage pulse is positive and therefore, you get like this. Therefore, you, you get a train of negative pulses during the positive half cycle of current. So, you will you will see one pulse in every one error voltage pulse in every carrier cycle. Again if you look at the negative half cycle of the current you would look at you get one positive error voltage pulse in every carrier cycle. So, this is how you can picturize your this you can picturize the error voltage pulses. So, let us say the current is like this let us say sorry let us say the current waveform is like this this is the fundamental current waveform the error voltage pulses will be like this. So, as I said before what we are more interested in this as far as the error voltages are concerned is we are more interested in the low frequency components of this and not really the high frequency component of this error. So, you can replace this by a square wave that is what you are doing is you are considering the average value of each pulse over a carrier cycle that is what you are doing. So, this is the average voltage. And how much is this average voltage equal to? That is what I as I said before V D C time T D upon 2 T S. So, which is what is shown in the next slide. So, this is an important information for us, and this square wave gives a measure of how much damage is caused by dead time or 
you know how much is the I mean the fundamental and the low frequency components which have been introduced on account of dead time uh, at the inverter output. So, this was the reason I drew this before when I did the sinusoidal current this is what I did. So, this was all that I have said now were the basis by which I did this now. So, when I do this what happens the actual pole voltage if you look at it let me take some other color. The actual pole voltage is supposed to be sinusoidal as given by this line, but the actual pole voltage will fall down like this. This error voltage will get added to that. This error voltage will get added to this like this. So, this is how it will be correct. Okay. So, it is no longer really a sinusoidal voltage. So, it is also clear from you for you like what you can do to compensate now what can you do to compensate now what is happening because of the dead time is the dead time is introducing a square wave who which has a particular amplitude and which is in phase opposition with the fundamental current and because of that the average pole voltage changes like this which is basically a square wave added to the sinusoid. So, if you want to correct that what do you do you take this you take the inverse of that and add it to the modulating signal that is all that you do effectively this is what you do for your dead time compensation. So, let us go back let us go back here. So, these are the error voltage average error in the pole voltage which we saw. So, what we are going to look at is these are how the variations is. So, this is how what I had plotted by hand here it is shown plotted already. So, this is sinusoidal sin triangle PWM. So, the average pole voltage is expected to be like this, but the average pole voltage actually changes like this. If you compensate for dead time that is you add you know a modulating I mean some signal to the modulating signal uh, which is equivalent to the negative of this error voltage then you can get rid of this error. So, that is what you do when you do a dead time compensation here. So, this picture shows you know the fundamental sinusoid this is the fundamental voltage that you will get and this is the average pole voltage. The average pole voltage contains several of the harmonic I mean the triplet frequency components. These triplet frequency components will vanish they are in the average pole voltage they will vanish in the line plane voltage and the load uh, applied voltage. So, in the load when it is you look at the phase to neutral voltage you will get this sinusoid this is what you will get ideally. Now, this sinusoid actually there is this kind of thing added up now. Okay. But of course, you know this the third harmonic components which are there in this will not be seen. So, the, the black waveform here is the sum of the ideal sinusoid waveform plus the square wave added up there. Okay. If I want to plot exactly the average pole voltage uh, what I should do is I must add this uh, um, uh, you know he, here of course, the current assumed is like this let me just draw the current here. So, the current waveform assumed is like this. the current waveform is assumed to be like this. Okay. So, if I actually want to draw the average pole voltage the error is negative here. So, you, you, you consider the actual modulating signal in this modulating I think I should change the color okay. choose some other color like here. Okay. This is the actual modulating signal this is representative of the average pole voltage. Now, the average pole voltage will be like this the average pole voltage will be something like this. This is how the average pole voltage will be and here the average pole voltage will shift sign. So, the average pole voltage will be something of this nature. sorry so i'm trying to sketch something like what would be the average pole voltage so this average pole voltage it contains fundamental component triplet frequency components which are part of 
the um, modulating signal the common mode components and it also has a square wave and all the frequency components that are added here. So, from this average pole voltage if I go to average line to line voltage similarly you know the y phase will also have. So, if I subtract V R O average minus V Y average what will happen is the fundamental will be intact. So, you know but the, the triplet frequency components the entire amount of the common mode component will go and also the third harmonic ninth harmonic 15th harmonic components etcetera the triplet frequency components in this waveform will go away. So, the remaining will be there. So, this contributes to certain amount of fundamental voltage which will get added up to this fundamental and again the square wave will contribute to certain amount of fifth harmonic, seventh harmonic and so on they will actually get added up to the sine wave and they will result in low frequency distortion. So, this is again we have given the say you know conventional space vector PWM and this is how the dead time error voltage is. So, now it is the main thing that we are supposed to actually go into that is bus clamping PWM. So, in, in all these cases what you have you always have this as a square wave you always have this as a square wave the error voltage is a square wave and how much is that that is actually given by V D C T D upon 2 T S this is what it is given by. When you go to this bus clamping PWM things are little different as we will see why one of the phases does not switch at all which phase will not switch that depends on which common mode signal you have added. If you have added this common mode signal one phase will be clamped to the positive bus and whichever is uh, got the maximum of the three sinusoidal modulating signals there is one phase which will have the maximum sinusoidal signal uh, and that phase will go get to the, to the positive bus. Again if you are adding this common mode then of the three sinusoidal signals one will be most negative that will get clamped to the negative bus. We follow this for 60 degree and this for 60 degree again follow this for 60 degree and 60 degree this is what we have been doing and that is what has been discussed here. So, we, we have a triplet frequency waveform a common mode component added to that. Now, can we make sure that all the six devices get loaded equally that is P the common mode component we will make sure is of P to 120 degree it contains only triplet frequency components and does not contain any DC component we make sure and we do this we apply a range of PWM methods. So, this is the so called 60 degree clamp PWM or sometime called DPWM 1 where a face is clamped at the middle 60 degrees everywhere now. So, one wonders how will dead time affect here what is the significant difference between here and there. Now, the PWM signal you see it is clamped earlier when we saw the error voltage the error voltage did not really depend on the duty ratio whether the duty ratio of the phase was 0.7 or 0.8 did not matter again whether the current was 10 ampere or 15 ampere did not matter what only mattered was the direction of current. The direction of current determined the sign of error voltage and what was that error voltage the, ma the magnitude of the error voltage was determined by the DC bus voltage the dead time and the switching frequency. So, these are the ones that determine here. Now, this is a special case where duty ratio is 1. When duty ratio of R phase is 1 what happens R phase stop device is conducting all through it does not switch at all. So, when it is not switching at all what is the actual pole voltage plus V D C by 2 what would be the ideal pole voltage same as that. So, plus V D C by 2 because the phase does not switch at all. So, there, there is no you know changes in the switching transition only if a phase switches then you know you will have to worry about whether it will switch at the same instant or it will be laid by T D during this interval of time R phase does not switch at all. So, the R phase pole voltage actually and ideally in both sense it is always equal to plus V D C by 2. So, in bus clamping PWM if you are looking at the error voltage average error voltage for R phase there will be no error voltage here. On the other hand will there be error voltage here yes there will be error voltage in this part there will be error voltage in this portion there will be error voltage in this portion. Once again there will be no error voltage here because R phase bottom device is continuously conducting there is no switching at all. So, there is no error voltage here the same thing can be said about Y phase the Y phase will have no error voltage here and here D phase will have no error voltage in this region excuse me and in this region. In other regions R phase has an error how much will that error be it will be the same thing as before it will be V D C multiplied by T D upon 2 T S and the direction or the polarity of the error voltage will depend upon the direction of current. So, now let us take one case what is this 60 degree clamp PWM again here we had all the three modulating signals before it is easier if we look at just one modulating signal that is the R phase modulating signal. So, what is this 
actually there are many things so let me explain it a little clearly this is the original r phase sinusoid you see that something of amplitude 0.8 this is the original r phase sinusoid okay now what is done is the y phase and the b phase sinusoids are not shown right you are getting the bus clamp you know the common mode signal is being subtracted so you are you are following the positive common mode here the you are following the negative common mode and this is the positive common mode and the negative common mode you are going on like this and uh, this is your common mode shown by this in this blue color this common mode is added to all the three modulating signals you, you know the other signals are not shown y phase is alone is shown when i add this common mode signal to this r phase what i am going to get i am going to get a modulating signal for r phase which is like this it is discontinuous here hence the name discontinuous pwm it clamps the r phase to positive bus for 60 degrees and clamps it for 60 degrees here because it clamps a particular each phase to uh, you know one of the dc buses you call it bus clamping pwm and since it clamps for 60 degree durations continuously you can call it as continual clamp pwm and is this 60 degrees is in the center of this uh, 180 i mean the positive half cycle so we call it a 60 degree clamp pwm here okay so when we say 60 degree clamp pwm we mean a phase is clamped during the middle 60 degree duration of its positive half cycle and again during the middle 60 degree duration of its negative half cycle okay so this is the modulating signal so the r phase switches here you know the duty ratio is changing the duty ratio is 0.5 here the duty ratio is lower than 0.5 here the duty ratio is greater than 0.5 here all right here the duty ratio is 1 then the duty ratio is something like uh, 0.7 or so here and it falls it comes to 0 and it goes something here and the duty ratio suddenly changes at this instant from here to there that is the effect of discontinuity once again the duty ratio starts falling it goes somewhere here so the duty ratio will be something like 0 0.3 and then it jumps to 0 it is 0 here this is the r phase duty ratio as you go along this now so whenever the duty ratio is something like this it does not matter as far as the error voltage is concerned because you know there is going to be some error voltage whenever the duty ratio is 1 there is no switching therefore there is going to be no error voltage again here there is going to be no error voltage now okay so error voltage is positive or negative who is going to decide the current now we have considered a situation where we are looking at unity power factor current and so this is the current waveform that is shown since both of them are in red you know so you, you mean in you know, uh, the fundamental modulating signal as well as current so that is the reason i am showing it clearly to you this is the modulating signal and this is the r phase current excuse me so this is the r phase current so it goes around like this now okay right so now this is the positive direction how should your this thing be on your based on your previous analysis let me choose some color should it be green let me choose green color now the the current is positive here therefore i will have an error voltage that error voltage will be negative that error voltage will be negative here so what will be in the next to the 60 degree range i have done for 0 to 60 60 to 120 what should i do the current is continuing to be positive one would expect this to continue here the same minus vr minus v error but this is a discontinuous pwm and the r phase is clamped here and therefore it has no error voltage here the error voltage is zero this is between 60 and 120 degree now you go between 120 and 180 degree what happens the phase comes out of clamping and the current is con positive and therefore you will have your error voltage like this this is what it will be now the current has a zero crossing and therefore the error voltage also changes sign and the error voltage is positive here again in this interval r phase is clamped though to the negative bus therefore the error voltage is zero and once again the error voltage is positive like this and how much is this error voltage as before it is vdc td upon 2ts this is what it is so this is the nature of error voltage and now what you have is this error voltage is getting applied what you are going to get is not this sinusoid but along with this modulating signal this will be your average pole voltage but on top of it this error voltage is also getting added so this is what will happen now if i do that let me choose another color of ink so if i subtract this error voltage what happens i get something like this so here there is no error voltage 
this is no error voltage. So, here it is no error right and what happens here it switches up then there is positive thing here the error is positive then the error is 0 and once again the error is positive. So, what is it that I have drawn here? What is it that I have drawn here? The original red one is the modulating signal and it is the scaled version of average pole voltage. This is modulating signal already normalized with respect to the peak of the carrier. You multiply this by VDC by 2, this is your average pole voltage VRO average. All right. Now, what we are going to get is average pole, this is the ideal average pole voltage, but the non ideal average pole voltage on account of dead time is what is shown by here, what is shown by here, what is shown here. So, what is the effect of this? It is certainly going to change the line to line voltage, it is certainly going to change the line to neutral voltage that is applied on the load. So, in effect what happens is you see this wave, this is no longer a square wave, it is sometimes minus V error 0, minus V error plus V error 0 and plus V error. So, but nevertheless it has a fundamental component. So, that fundamental component will be reflected in the load fund voltage also. So, the fundamental component is going to change. This will have third harmonic, ninth harmonic etcetera, they will get cancelled off but this will have fifth harmonic and seventh harmonic they will get applied across the load. So, the fundamental component of this error voltage fifth harmonic, seventh harmonic etcetera will get applied onto that and therefore, there is going to be low frequency distortion as we mentioned before. The main difference between continuous clamp PWM and discontinuous in all the continuous clamp PWM you found this error voltage to be a square wave. This V error was constant and it was negative for the positive currents and uh, it was positive for negative currents, it was a square wave, it was only shifting in phase, but now you see that it sometimes goes to 0 also that is a significant difference between bus clamping PWM and these ones. So, let us now look at the next example the same 30 degree 60 degree clamp PWM, but at 30 degree power factor angle now. So, let me do this error voltage business. So, what is the error voltage here? first consider 30 degrees. So, what is the direction of current? The direction of current is negative up to this point and therefore, my error voltage will be positive, error voltage will be positive, this is the current. So, here the current changes direction therefore, the error voltage becomes negative. So, this is my minus V error average voltage the same VDC uh, you know uh, into TD upon 2 TS that I wrote now. In, in this duration the R phase is not switched at all therefore, it is like this therefore, it is like this. Now, what happens? The direction of current has changed let me let me be clear where is the direction of current yeah this is the current waveform ok up to this point is negative here it changes and therefore, the error becomes positive here it is like this up to this point. Now, here it is clamped the face is clamped and therefore, the error is 0 once again it goes like this. So, this is plus V r here also plus V r and what is this V r uh, 2 T s you know V d c T d divided by 2 T s same as before, but the wave sh shape is different. So, this itself was different from what you had it is not a square wave it had zeros. Now, you see the same 60 degree clamp PWM, but at a different power factor you have this. So, the nature of this error voltage waveform now depends on the PWM method and even for a particular discontinuous PWM method it depends on the power factor angle. You can do this exercise quickly for let us say another power factor. Now, where is the current waveform? This is the current waveform. This is represents the fundamental voltage, this is the fundamental current now. So, let me do this. Since the current is negative here, I should have positive voltage here. So, the positive error voltage is positive, but only up to this point. Now, it is clamped, so it is 0. Here, the error voltage is negative, it continues, it goes on like this, it is negative. So, here the error voltage is 0. So, here the current direction is negative and therefore, the error voltage is positive. So, once again I should emphasize that this is 
v error as before and this is minus v error as before but this value has not changed but the waveform has changed is it all right so let us look at another case this is 30 degree clamp pwm what happens here the face is clamped between 30 to 60 degree and, and 120 to 150 degree when i here our face is clamped so in the middle 30 degree of every quarter cycle 0 to 90 degree is one quarter and in the middle 30 degree that is 30 to 60 degree it is clamped and again in the middle 30 degree of the next quarter it is clamped so that is 30 degree clamp pwm another very nice pwm method this is the pwm method which gives you the lowest harmonic distortion among all the bus clamping pwm methods as i have mentioned before so now let us say you consider a 30, 30 degree clamp pwm and you consider zero power factor load how is that if you do that exercise how are you going to get it let us say i will choose the same color here fine so the current is negative here the current is shown in black color the current is negative therefore you would expect the voltage to be positive the error voltage to be positive but since the face is clamped here the error voltage becomes zero right again what happens it is positive at this instant the current crosses zero and therefore the error becomes like this the error is now negative once again the error is zero because the face is clamped so here what happens subsequently it is the current is positive the error voltage is negative like this and it goes on it goes on here the error voltage is once again zero because the face is clamped and now the current is negative therefore it is like this here the current changes direction and the error voltage changes sign and once again the error voltage is zero because of clamping and then it goes like this so you look at this waveform now you look at this this is plus vr v error zero plus v error minus v error zero here it is minus v error 0 minus v error plus v error 0 and minus v error those are the values this waveform is very very different from the previous waveforms you have seen so this shows that when you change from one pwm method to another pwm method one bus clamping pwm method to another bus clamping pwm method is the waveform is going to change very significantly the same way you can do this exercise for 30 degree clamping pwm for some other value of that some other value okay so here again i have negative current so let us quickly identify wherever you have clamping so wherever you have clamping it is zero that is one way of doing it quickly right so these are the error voltages are zero okay now here the current is negative and therefore it is positive here the current is positive therefore this is negative here the current is positive therefore it is negative yes here the current is negative this becomes so positive so this is the error voltage waveform for the same 30 degree prank pwm but it's some lagging power factor angle this is incidentally 30 degree lagging angle so you see how it differs you can do this exercise for any given bus clamping pwm that is any modulating signal and any power factor again we have this of uh, z of unity power factor so because the phase doesn't switch there is no error voltage in these regions the phase doesn't switch there's no error voltage in these regions right then you have positive therefore the error voltage is negative here again the current direction is positive it's negative here the current is negative the current changes sign the error voltage changes sign so the current is like this error is like this now yeah so now you see at a different power factor the same 30 degree clamp it is different now but the v error value is still the same you know it, it i mean it still depends on the same thing you know vds into let, should i write it again it's the same vdc td upon 2ts that is your v error so you can do this for anything this is continual clamp like where you have clamped like this continuously for 60 degree and uh, this is continual clamp where this is you know when we saw for switching loss this is for the lagging power factor load this is to reduce switching loss and leading power factor loads this is split clamp pwm which is good for from the point of view of switching loss it is good for uh, loads having power factor angles between 60 to 90 degree and this is for 90 degree lead or lag it's i mean this is split clamp 2 here the sum of these two clamping durations anyway add to 60 degree and this continual clamp and split clamp can be seen on the space vector domain so the where the, you have a revolving reference vector you sample it 
and you time average these vectors and produce the reference vector and that for time averaging these are the equations you apply the three vectors like t1 t2 and tz as shown before as we have discussed all this many times over uh, the space vector mod based pwm module and you are applying the your you know uh, inverter states like 0 1 2 7 7 2 1 0 so on with bus clamping sequences you apply them as 0 1 2 2 1 0 and so on so the switching sequence is 0 1 2 2 1 0 or switching sequence is 1 2 7 7 2 1 so now if you look at the continual clamp in the space vector domain what do you have this is how you can look at this is continuous so here there is this region over which r phase is clamped to positive bus and again this is the region over which r phase is clamped to the negative bus you can see that it is clamped to positive so here what you will have is v error for r phase will be zero in this region again v error for r phase excuse me v error for r phase is zero in this region in the other regions it will be for for r phase v error in this region for example it will depend on the current direction it will be plus uh, v error i mean plus uh, you know v, uh, vdc td by 2s or minus vdc by 2ts now again this is the split clamp pwm which you know when represented in the space vector domain you can see that r phase is clamped here and again r phase is clamped here so these two durations add up to 60 degree this is gamma this is 60 minus gamma these two add to 60 degree again you have the same scenario here here r phase is clamped to negative bus here also the r phase is clamped to the negative bus so this is for a duration 60 minus gamma and this is for gamma so they add up to 60 degrees now okay so this is for example gamma this is 60 minus gamma so they add up to 60 degree so in this case the error for r phase is 0 the error for r phase is so here also you will have v error for r phase is 0 whenever it is clamped it is 0 otherwise it is that plus average you know v error or minus average v error so this is how you can actually do it you know you can uh, for any pwm method so uh, that is any bus clamping pwm method so the bus clamping pwm methods have to be either continual clamp or or uh, this uh, split clamp pwm method so for any of these pwm methods it is possible for you to analyze the effect of dead time so once you have that square wave you can do the harmonic analysis of square wave the fifth seventh etc would be the low frequency distortion the fundamental component that you really have you can once again do that this is your v ideal and you have your current now there will be an error voltage that is v error this need not be at 180 degrees this angle is not 180 degrees now that will change from pwm method to pwm method and power factor also this v error is added to that and now this will be your v actual so what happens is also there is a drop difference in these voltages v actual and v ideal so this can actually be seen as an ir drop so in in induction motor drives this can be seen as some additional stator resistance and when the stator resistance is high it causes instability so this uh, though i have not discussed it here in this module dead time also has the effect of increasing light load instability in induction motor drives which is also something that you can find in certain papers though if you compensate for dead time you can handle light load instability it will becomes good so thus you know we have discussed this dead time i hope you found this lecture useful and uh, you know uh, i hope that uh, you would follow the remaining lectures with uh, continued interest thank you very much